outside the Kenya, which politician inspires you most? Outside Kenya, I'm inspired in terms of, 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 of leadership by people like Nelson Mandela, who I think has also got a lot of characteristics that my own father had. But I'm also inspired, again, by people like our neighbor here, um, Kagame, actually using politics and leadership to transform society. Those are kind of people I really admire and look up to in terms of politics because I think we have had a tendency, especially in Kenya, we have always associated politics, not with leadership, but politics as in position. And I think that's where, especially we in Kenya, go wrong. We don't see politics as a leadership forum, as an ability for leaders to congregate, to put ideas together for the betterment of your society, but rather we use it as a platform for for competition and for mudslinging and for... Do you read our papers? You know, these days I don't even buy newspapers. I save those shillings these days. It's not even worth it. Because it's just full of who said what, who did what. Like Kenyans are going to eat who said what and who did what. What Kenyans want is to see real hard development agenda that moves their careers and lives ahead that helps us achieve our vision and our dreams. That's what we want. Huh? That's what we want. Huh? You have driven me into politics and I will hold you to it. Over the last uh, seven years, we have seen our tax collection move from 108 billion to nearly 800 billion this year. You are in the finance ministry and uh, in charge of Kenya Revenue Authority. How do you explain this fourfold growth in tax revenue? You know, the most amazing thing is that this money is not new money. This money was there. It is just commitment and efficiency. That is all. People saying that, look, we need to mobilize our resources for our own development. You know, I was an opponent, for example, of um, our sitting president, now President Mwai Kibaki, uh, in 2002, when they whitewashed me completely. But yeah, I still stood. And I used to look at him as a gentleman sometimes and used to say, you know, this man, he says nothing, you know, until I coined a phrase there that I was saying, hands off, feet, ears off, everything off. But eventually, what he did, which is really appreciative, he started putting competent people into jobs. That he was not putting people in jobs on the basis that they were his friends, but people who were competent, who had the capacity to do those jobs. So if it is in revenue, you put somebody who has the capacity, and somebody who has the will and want to do the job. Because that is one area that we, have, we really had blackslided before. And it's by doing so, and allowing professionals to do their job, that we've managed to get to a level where today, Kenya is the only country in the East African uh, uh, region where 100% of our recurrent expenditure comes not from donors, but from the taxes collected from Kenyans. So our teachers, we pay. Our, our, our health workers, we pay. Our civil servants, we pay. Countries like Uganda, Tanzania, they have at least 40% of their budget, their recurrent budget, financed by donors. Sisi hakuna shilingi ya muzungu ambaye nalipa mwalimu katika Kenya hii. And that is something to be proud of. And that is because we have the right people doing the right jobs. Deputy Prime Minister, out of your 1.2 uh, trillion budget this year, you allocated uh, Vision 2030 flagship projects, which I had 500 million. How 500 billion. 
Why the generosity? First and foremost, it's not generosity because whatever has been put in. I say generosity because in the past, only 18 to 20 percent was allocated to development budget. Now, 50 percent. 50 percent goes to development. And that is why I'm saying it's not generosity because ultimately, these young people in this room will have to pay for what is being done. But I believe it is a worthwhile investment. Why do I believe it is a worthwhile investment? If you look at this country, I remember in 1990 something, 99, going around 2000, we were celebrating in Kisumu 100 years of the railway, which was called the Lunatic Express, from Mombasa all the way down to Kisumu onto Kampala. That railway line was done a hundred years ago by the colonists in order for them to enter. But look, when you follow development in this country, development followed the railway line. Look at all the major towns in Kenya, Nairobi, Nakuru, Eldoret, Kisumu, all of them are where? Along the railway line. So what does that tell you? That infrastructure is critical to develop a nation. And we must spend on infrastructure today if we want future generations to have a livelihood worth talking about. We need this highway that we're doing now. This highway, a lot of people call it Nairobi Fika. This is not the Nairobi Fika Highway. This is the beginning of a highway that is supposed to link Kenya with Ethiopia. From here, Thika, we move on to Nyeri, to Nyanyuki, to Isiolo, to link up with the other one now that is being done from Isiolo, crossing over to Marsabit, up to Moyale, to link us with a huge market called Ethiopia with over 80 million people. Those are opportunities for our young people but we cannot exploit those opportunities because we cannot access that market. By doing that road, we are going to be able to do it. The amount of money we've invested in the study to do the railway line from Lamo to Isiolo, again, one branch going up to Moyale and uh, Ethiopia, another branch going up to Sudan. That should bring development in those areas, just like the Nairobi Kisumu railway line has brought development to this region. That again is investment in opportunities for future generations. We need to spend on developing infrastructure in this country if we are going to secure the future. Look, look at a very small thing that people today look at and think it's a very you know, small thing. The undersea cable that was launched by the president less than uh, four years ago that links us through the internet with the rest of the world. That has the reduced the cost of internet connectivity in Kenya by a huge margin. That has enabled a number of different companies to establish themselves in Kenya, create and offer job opportunities for Kenyans to do backroom operations for major international organizations worldwide given our fluency in English, given our locality. But had we not invested in that cable, those jobs would not be there today. This is why we must invest in our Vision 20 flagship projects, because investing in those projects is investing in the future of the people of this country. We are not a country that is endowed with gold and, and, and oil and all those things. All we have are these people. We just have 40 million Kenyans. And God has been good to us that they are hardworking people. We just need to create opportunities and they will blossom and grow and flow and service the entire, the entire world right here from Kenya. Right here from Kenya. Without having to export our labor, live in Kenya, but service the region and ultimately the world. And I think to do so, we must focus on these projects going on. 
It's good to have great plans for the future and to ensure the future is not a continuation of the past. But what are your plans about the famine-stricken uh, arid regions where now Kenyans are rising for Kenya? What plans do you have? You know, it's a very sad situation that is actually going on in this country. Um, a situation that has been caused by what is now become a phenomenon that is with us, and that is this issue of global climate change. But the poor and unfortunate thing is that we have not planned for this. We have basically just assumed for many years as a country that Itanyesha, the long rains will come in April, Natutapanda, the short rains will come, Nangombe Itapata Chakula, and that's been our cycle. But we have refused to actually think ahead. And this is something that we actually took on board when I came to the Ministry of Finance a few years ago. And we said, we can no longer focus on rain-fed agriculture in this country. And we started putting a lot of money to actually see how we can mitigate against these effects. We started a huge project, for example, going down towards um, um, along Tana River to Inhola and a major irrigation scheme. And the whole idea was that we need to move as a country away from rain-fed um, agriculture to irrigation, where we can be sure of our food security. We started a number of projects up in West Pokot, another in parts of Turukana. I don't know whether you saw in the, in the picture, in the newspapers the other day, and something that made me very proud and happy. A Turukana woman and gentleman who are harvesting their millet. That is a scheme that we started about three years ago. To today, where we have invested about 10 billion shillings to um, initiate an irrigation scheme in uh, Abiswan up towards uh, uh, in northeastern Wajia, and to intensify irrigation in Kitui and other areas so that we can harvest our water and use this water to ensure that even when future droughts occur, we do not find ourselves in the kind of circumstance that we have found ourselves in today. But again, these are investments that we have to make and they have to be continuous. And we ourselves must ensure that as we invest in these, we are also open and start teaching and training our own people to also change some of their traditional attitudes and approaches towards life. You know, we, we, we can no longer say that, uh, you know, we just depend on livestock. We need to depend on livestock, but we must also ensure that we must be food secure and we must train our people that as much as we have livestock, let's do the irrigation and some people must be left behind farming in order to ensure that uh, um, we, we, we don't land ourselves in a food scarce kind of situation going forward. These are all investments. I mean, it may not be noticeable today. And it is unfortunate because we are continuing with this cycle and we are right now in the middle of a major drought cycle. And I want to thank all Kenyans who have actually contributed towards helping alleviate this problem. But I want us to be able to understand that going forward, the only true solution is not year on year contributing to feed people, but ensuring that we invest in all these irrigation kind of schemes so that people are able to stand on their own two feet and they are not, uh, and they are able to withstand these continuous cycles of drought as they come through. They are able to withstand them on their own because of an investment that we have made as a nation. And that's where we need to go. The issue of youth unemployment. Youth unemployment. I would again say youth unemployment. This country has a major, major challenge of a lot of highly intelligent, bright young people who have gone through all the paces of their education only to end up without a firm job or a place to earn a living. If we don't invest in that, you can talk about anything else, but you don't have a country if your youth have no hope in their own country. And how are you creating opportunities for the youth as uh, the Minister for Finance? You have the you have the budget. We will get to a situation where we are able to ensure and to guarantee that every child in Kenya is able to get an education from primary 
through to high school and ultimately to university me nataka ku retire niende nika enjoy grandchildren if my children will give me that and relax and enjoy life 